The you... ideas came uh, from the 1960s, basically. Okay. okay. And the um, I was studying political science, yeah. uh, political theory, and the the key the key insight that I had uh, was that many of the questions I was exploring that my teachers and the books that I was reading that were exploring about key notions in politics, mm. um, freedom, power, order, authority, equality, inequality, mm. and so forth, were um, uh, resident also in technological things. Um, so I announced this in uh, various ways to people I was uh, working with. Mm. And their first um, response was, well, that's interesting, but it's not really uh, political mm. in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and they had these, these notions that, well, you had um, uh, uh, kinds of things that engineers worked on or that were of interest to um, people in business schools. Um, but the technology was uh, something other than politics itself. Mm -hmm. Politics had to do with um, congresses and elections and lawmaking and and so forth. So I was heavily discouraged from this uh, pursuit. The um, um, people who did support me, interestingly enough, were those in organization theory, which had become a part of political science to some extent. People who studied large bureaucracies, public administration, and so forth. <clears throat> so they saw a um, relationship to uh, what they were doing in the questions that I was uh, was raising. Mm. Um, later on, as, as you know, I came to, uh, to understand in raising the question, uh, do artifacts have politics? That was a much, much later step for me. Um, uh, that the answer was yes, and then the question uh, became, how does one um, explore that? Mm. But at the time I was in, uh, in, in Berkeley, um, working on my PhD uh, in politics, also writing uh, for, Ro for Rolling Stone and all kinds of things, yeah. uh, it was a time of uh, chaos, upheaval, a fruitful upheaval. Um, and if you could keep your head about you, which I tried to do mainly by avoiding drugs, <clears throat> um, then there was a, just a, a vast array of interesting um, issues to look at. And um, so as I thought about the relationship of, of uh, technology to politics, was looking for a way to do that, one, one, one early idea was just to study systems theory, which was the social science way of understanding human machine systems, communication systems, and so forth. But I really came to, to feel that systems theory in and of itself was pretty sterile. So at, at a certain point, and I don't even know exactly how this happened, it occurred to me that um, experiences of my um, childhood movie viewing and of my reading not only in um, social science and social theory, um, but also in, in uh, science fiction, mm. you know, Asimov, uh, um, Philip Dick and so forth. There were lots of stories um, in this Frankenstein mode uh, of somebody who makes something or a group that makes something, releases it into the world and then it comes back at them with surprising uh, characteristics and consequences. Um, and then I noticed the relationship between that uh, and a, a group of thinkers I had found interesting, Lewis Mumford, uh, who in a way was, uh, particularly in his later work, talking about technologies that had run out of control. His book, The Pentagon of Power in particular, uh, describes that. Uh, Marcuse, one-dimensional man, which described a certain uh, kind of rationality, which had turned out to be uh, highly problematic in uh, politics and, and social life. Uh, and in, in particular, also, um, the, the writings of Jacques Ellul. Um, one afternoon I was talking to um, a friend of mine, an older uh, um, graduate student, Gary Reed, the late Gary Reed, wonderful man, I miss him greatly. I, I told him about this uh, interest in technology and politics. 
And he said, well, there was a book he'd seen in the uh, <clears throat> Telegraph Avenue bookstore called The Technological Society by this French sociologist and theologian Jacques Ellul. And uh, he thought maybe I, <clears throat> I should take a look at it. So I went to the bookstore, bought the book, brought it home. It was about 4 in the afternoon. I started reading it and didn't stop until about 4 a.m. I hadn't finished it, but that's when I stopped reading it in, the, in, in that in that pass. So the the book Autonomous Technology uh, is about uh, technologies that run uh, beyond human control, achieve a certain kind of independence, and it talks about that uh, uh, broadly. We can perhaps dis discuss some of the, the themes in it. But for me, at, at, at one level, it was a way to bridge the <clears throat> history and philosophy of politics, uh, with uh, an emerging interest in uh, technology and, and human life. I don't like to dwell on my own biography, <laughs> autobiography, <laughs> but you know, um, um, I was born very premature. Okay. Um, by the time um, my father reached the hospital, the doctors met him at the door and said, the baby won't live, we hope we can save your wife. It was right at the end of World War II, in that little town there was one incubator and it was already full, so the doctors put together this kind of box, and obviously as I sit here today, <laughs> I, I did, sur did survive, but I was a scrawny little kid, huh? and uh, <clears throat> couldn't play sports very well and so forth. And uh, so I became a reader, um, but it was a not not a an environment in which the classics or the great books were um, focused upon or known. Or so I knew textbooks, I knew children's books. You know, I remember reading in the sixth grade. I checked out and read cover to cover with very limited understanding. Melville's Moby Dick. <laughs> It's a great story about whales, by the way. It's wonderful. <laughs> anyway, and I had this, this feeling in uh, certainly early on in high school that there was a big world out there. And uh, then there were cracks in the, the San Luis Obispo culture that began to appear. One of them was rock and roll, especially uh, people like Chuck Berry, uh, Little Richard, and so forth, which heard them sing on the records, and uh, saw their movies, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, also, I began listening to jazz, I was listening to classical music and jazz, and, and so forth. Another crack in uh, conventionality. And uh, then, then one day I was um, visiting the house of a uh, high school classmate. Their, the family there had a large library this. And um, so I was looking at all these things and I essentially asked myself the question that I've been asking, asking myself for a long time. Mm -hmm. How could I ever have access to this? Where would one even begin? Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and then on the shelf, I mean my uh, recollection is it literally jumped out into my hand, it was a book. It was called The Lifetime Reading. It was written by a New York um, book editor. His name was Clifton Fadiman. He was often on TV. I remember having seen him on TV about this when this experience happened. <clears throat> In this book, The Lifetime Reading Program, which proposed about uh, 150 books from the Greeks uh, to the present day. Yeah with a two or three page summary and then a list of things you could buy. At the time, paperback books were coming into, uh, into production, very cheap. And um, so it said, uh, Plato, he lived this time, he believed this, he argued this, here were his points of view. And then I turned the page and it was Sappho, the great parent, the great feminist poet. Oh, yeah. and, and Aristotle and Homer and uh, on it went through St. Augustine and you know Hobbes 
and Marx, and, you know, and Jane Austen. And all of a sudden, I said, I'm free. <laughs> um, it gave me a framework, and I went out and I said, lifetime uh, reading plan. Hell, I'm going to read them all this summer. <laughs> So I went out and just bought, and a lot of them are still in this room, these stacks of stacks of books. But then I, I wondered, how could this be misread? Uh, how could it be misread? Right. Well, I can go back and read what I said. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> no. Yeah. Colin, here's, here's the yeah. thing. I yeah. mean, you get to the end of this book, you yeah. remember the, the, the whole chapter is called Frankenstein's Problem. Yes. <clears throat> where I talk about the, the problem for Victor Frankenstein, which, which, by the way, it seems to me a kind of... Um, you know, early feminist um, under understanding of the problem of amassing uh, great power and using it without much regard at all, any regard for the, the responsible steering and, and formation of that. So this, this is the monster's uh, argument to Victor. Uh, if you don't find a place for me in this world, uh, there will be hell to pay, and there is, obviously. Yeah. And I, I still find, uh, one of the things I want to do in the next... Uh, year or so, is to read a good intellectual biography of Mary Shelley. She was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, who, and I think, who died in childbirth, yeah. and of William Godwin. And these, uh, Mary uh, uh, Wollstonecraft was um, uh, the great um, female philosopher of her time, uh, kind of incipient feminist. And William Godwin was essentially the great uh, social thinker of his time in a kind of libertarian mode, you know, exalting freedom variously expressed. Um, and of course, Mary Shelley ended up with uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, her husband, later to be her husband, Lord Byron, who was a, a supporter of the uh, Luddites and so forth. So, you know, it would be interesting for me to know more about what went into making this uh, extraordinary book. Well, I think my, my advice would be to um, escape the frameworks, <laughs> escape the paradigms, escape the um, familiar theories. Um, I guess what we're talking about here, uh, um, for better or worse, I'm not the smartest person, not the brightest bulb, but it was at a certain point, I thought, well, yes, I could um, take some of these materials in, these ideas in, and have something to say that might, that might, might make some difference. And I really do, do think that um, every person um, at least has that possibility uh, within themselves, right? Um, and you and I, I know, have talk, talked about uh, my... Um, uh, meeting with Don Van Vliet, Captain Beefheart, you know, and he just never what, took on, he never allowed himself to be tamed, which meant he was kind of hell on wheels and hard to get along. And I had to learn how to deal with those moments where he would sort of, would sort of erupt. But he had a completely, I would say, original relationship to <clears throat> the phenomena around him. And he expressed this in art of various kinds. He always fought with, you know, record companies and lawyers and, 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 and all of that. Um, and um, um, he always described himself as just a little boy who refused to grow up. He told his, um, his parents, he told his mother, you be Sue and I'll be Don and we'll let it go with that, right? <laughs> A strange, a strange view of, uh, of the world, but, you know, I think uh, one thing I don't like about um, um, academic disciplines is the way that instead of uh, enabling people to speak their vision, they uh, impede that seriously. So I guess my, my message would be uh, tell us what you know, who you are, and what you would recommend. <laughs>